Welcome to the October 4th presentation for our equine series. Um, we've done a, a variety of series of equine pasture management as well as just equine series covering a variety of topics that you guys have requested and some things that are more pertinent to different times of the year. So today we're lucky to have back gracing our presence today is Dr. Jenny Ivey. She is our UT equine specialist and we're very fortunate to have her on staff and our group has got to experience her over the past uh, two or three months and some of her uh, areas of expertise and just feels that she feels that our group would really benefit from having more information. Uh, and today it, it is definitely answering that call as well. We have one covering equine nutrition diet fads, just the same as we have for humans. There's always somebody new coming out with something new and some are worthwhile and some are uh, not as much. And so hopefully Dr. Ivy will fill us in on a few that are worth paying attention to uh, on the positive and the negative. So welcome, Dr. Ivy, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Matt. So um, <clears throat> like you mentioned, equine nutrition is kind of filled with all these different options for you as a horse owner. And so hopefully as we go through these next couple slides um, and through the rest of the presentation, we'll kind of give you some tools to be able to say, yes, my horse needs this, no, my horse doesn't need it, or at least equip you with the knowledge to kind of filter through maybe what you're already feeding at home and whether it's worth a dollar based upon um, the impact that it may have on your horse. So uh, the biggest thing for you to understand, okay, is that a lot of times we as horse owners will mix our own knowledge of human nutrition and human dietary recommendations and basically insert them into our horse's equine nutrition plan. And we almost do this kind of without even thinking. Um, we see this very commonly also within the canine and the feline nutrition realms. Um, but the, the big piece for you to understand is that the, the driving force behind what the equine either feed companies or supplement companies are producing is largely driven on what other horse owning public is asking for. So whether that's, you know, the big trend a couple years ago was joint supplements. And if you actually kind of looked all of a sudden there was this big boom of joint supplements that hit the market, okay? And then the other is the really feed and supplement company driven. So what can they make that they either see a need for within their industry, excuse me, or <clears throat> that they know that they can make and produce at a price point that would be very beneficial for them. So a lot of really what we think about when we think about equine nutrition and specifically kind of our supplement lines, often very much mimics our maybe GNC or other nutrition store. And so I put this picture in here to kind of help show you. Obviously, this is maybe a, a aisle in a, a local feed store loaded with different supplements and different options. And if we walk into a nutrition supplement store for humans, it often very lo much looks the same, right? There's loads of choices. There's loads of options. All of their brands are saying that they can do it the best. And the question comes back to what do you need, right? What, what is the best option for your horse that you can purchase that will make the most sense from an economic perspective? and also to actually have an impact on your horse's either performance or health or whatever um, factor we're looking to improve, okay? The other kind of piece is that the, specifically more the supplement company and maybe even to some point the nutrition companies have looked for, is that horse owners very frequently have little contact with an equine nutritionist. And so there was a study done not too long ago that asked horse owners, where do you get information on your supplements? And the top two, um, groups were really farriers and veterinarians, which makes sense because that's usually what horse owners have the most contact with, right? <clears throat> my farrier comes out once every four to six weeks, maybe every six to eight weeks to trim my horse's feet. And I see my vet about maybe twice a year at a minimum, sometimes more if my horse has a lot of problems. But often we're not really consulting with any equine nutritionist to be able to say, what's my nutrition plan look like? And so a lot of veterinarians that I've spoken to have talked to about how little nutrition they really get in vet school. And so finding that equine nutritionist to talk to, whether it's through your county agent um, or through another means might be really helpful in order for you to figure out kind of how to utilize some of this information if it, at the end you feel like you're still kind of a little confused. So what I wanted to do today is go through a, a few different diet fads or diet trends that we see in the equine world and kind of debunk them and give you some tools to use. So the first one I want to talk to you about is this no or low carb diet, okay? And these particular products hit the market probably about 10 to 15 years ago, and they have improved since then. 
Um, but the biggest thing for you to remember is that <clears throat> there is no such thing as a no carb diet for horses. Okay. And if we think about that, that should make sense to you, right? Because my horses go out and they graze, right? They, that forage should be the primary component of their diet. Well, within those plants, there are fibrous carbohydrates that the hindgut or that cecum within the horse needs to be able to digest and ferment with those microbes back there to provide your horse with energy. And so if I eliminated all of those fibrous carbohydrates from the diet, your horse would have some really, really big um, gastrointestinal dysfunction. And so there is no no carb diet, okay? or no no starch diet. All horse diets have some component of starch within them, okay? But now that what we're seeing is that these companies, instead of utilizing these terms that are technically incorrect, they're now marketed as low carb, okay? And that is actually much more of an appropriate way, okay? Really, it could be low simple carbohydrate or lower simple carbohydrate. And that would be really the most appropriate way for us to look at it, all right? So these particular feeds are really designed to help our horses with maybe insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, the horses that are laminitis prone, um, or have a variety of other factors that we'll talk about here in a second. But the question I always get from owners is, well, you know, I feed a low, a low starch diet, um, but what did they do to make it low starch? Okay, so a lot of times what they have done is they have taken out the molasses component. Okay, and if you think about what molasses is, right, it's really just a very sugary, thick mixture that tends to make feed more palatable to horses. And palatable really meaning just that the horses will eat it fairly well. They like the taste of it. So by cutting out that molasses, we can inherently make that feed low starch because I've taken out a lot of the sugar, okay? The other thing that we can do is we can reduce the total amount of grain, specifically corn, um, within that feed to help also decrease the starch content. Okay, but the, one of the biggest misconceptions that I get um, from owners is that they think by switching from a traditional feed, okay, so whether that's just a, a feed marketed for performance or maintenance or whatever it is, to a low starch feed, a low starch concentrate, will alleviate all of the problems that we see with laminitis when horses go out and graze, okay, and that's not the case. And so here's why we, we want to make sure that we consider all of these factors, okay, so in the recommended equine diet, <clears throat> we should have that horse consuming between two to two and a half percent of their body weight in forage every single day. So if your horse goes out and grazes and he's out 24 seven, we can assume that your horse has his head down and eating. And again, this is if you have enough pasture for him to do this. Okay, they obviously can't graze if there's just a lot of weeds or a lot of bare spots. But if there's enough grass for them to eat, they'll eat for about 18 hours a day. Okay, and if we actually calculate that out, and figure out how much dry matter or how much actual nutrients your horse is eating per day, it actually works right back out to this two to two and a half percent of their body weight, okay? So that's why when we make recommendations or if you talk to me or some of our agents, they'll recommend that number for you, that's where it comes from, all right? But the important thing to remember is that plants also contain starches and fructans, okay? So these are usually the two kind of buzzwords around pasture-associated laminitis or insulin resistance. And remember that starch is just the storage form of glucose, okay, or, or simple sugars in the body. And fructan is another storage form that the plants will utilize. And so even if we reduce the amount of starch in the concentrate, that forage that your horse is containing and that they need to eat every single day also contains starches and fructans, okay? And so this is why when we go back to making our recommendations for horse diets, we always say feed the forage first. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to consider all of the different nutrients that that forage provides and then supplement with a concentrate when your horse's dietary requirements every day are not met. And the reason that we want to hold off and only use concentrates is if we have to is that grains, really no matter what they are, are always higher in starch than a lot of our grasses. And so it's really hard for us to truly get a, the lowest starch diet possible by feeding any sort of concentrate. You wanna go back to those forages. And often what's happening in the feeds that you're buying that are marketed as low starch is that the, the feed companies have replaced some of the grains with a, a different fibrous forage source. So maybe beet pulp, maybe um, <clears throat> alfalfa, okay? So that's really what's happening. So the feed company is really capitalizing 
on that basic foundation of feeding the forage and feeding those fibrous carbohydrates. The other thing to remember is that some products, um, like we said, can be formulated to be lower in starch, but never, never, ever can they be truly carbohydrate free. Okay, so it's important for you to remember that if we're talking about a low starch diet, that there is still some form of starch in that feed and also other carbohydrates that your horse needs. Okay, so we're never going to be able to cut them out. We can't make an Atkins diet for horses. Okay. So I want to utilize Purina <clears throat> as an example here, and I want to give a lot of credit to Purina um, because they do a great job of providing a lot of information about their feed in a readily accessible format on their website. <clears throat> so by no means is this to say that these two are the best feeds or um, criticize them in any way, but their information is really easy to find and it's really easy to compare. So what I've done is I've taken just two different feeds that they have. The Impact Pro is a pelleted feed um, <clears throat> designed for the, the working kind of performance animal. And then the Well Solve LS, okay, or low starch, is exactly that. It's their low starch marketed option. And I apologize if so I wasn't able to find the ingredient list for the Impact Professional. But what I want to start with is just looking at the guaranteed analysis or what's on the feed tag to show you kind of what's happening here, okay? So if we look at crude protein, okay, obviously the protein content in our performance feed is going to be a little bit higher than what I would expect my horse to need at a maintenance level, all right? So that's why there's a 12% protein in the low starch feed and 14% in our more performance feed or impact in this case, okay? <clears throat> if you look, though, lysine percent, which is going to be our indicator of, of protein quality in the feed, um, it's about four lines down here on this tag. It's right here on the well solve, and it's the second line on impact, okay? And both of those are the same. So what that's telling me as a nutritionist is that the protein quality in both of these feeds is equivalent. There's just a little less protein in the low starch option. And that's completely fine because most of the time our horses at maintenance, even up to moderate work, um, typically only need about eight to 10% crude protein in the diet to meet their needs. So I have no concern about the fact that this low starch feed is a little lower in, or in protein. Okay, and as we look through and we kind of go down here, I want to point out to you the fiber content. Okay, so if we look over here, the crude um, fiber content maximum is 15% in this impact professional. Okay, if we look over here at the well solved, the fiber maximum is 23%. Okay, that's a really big difference in fiber compared to these two feeds. And if we look down at the ingredients, we now see the first ingredient as alfalfa, shredded beet pulp, and wheat mitts, okay? So these two um, particular ingredients up front are really what are causing this fiber portion to increase and overall what have allowed this fiber or this, um, this feed, I'm sorry, excuse me, to be lower in starch and lower in sugars than it would have been if we were looking at maybe this feed here with a starch content of 11% and a sugar content of 6.5, okay? So by no means is, it, is the low starch option sugar or starch free, but it's just lower, okay? And that's really important for you to remember and look at as you're kind of walking through the feed tech, okay? <clears throat> and so since we, we know that maybe these no or low carb options um, really are kind of mismarketed if that's how they're being referred to, but we've got these low starch feeds that are really good for some horses, but they're really not the best for all of our horses across the board, okay? So if you've got a horse that's maybe dealing with um, equine Cushing's disease or pituitary pars intermediary dysfunction, okay, it's classified typically on the outward side by a hair coat that doesn't shed out, uh, pasture-associated laminitis or insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, um, <clears throat> and often you'll start to see some other metabolic dysfunction in these horses as well. This might be a time where if this horse is having a lot of trouble maintaining weight, but we're really still worried about the starch and sugar content of the diet, that a low starch option could be really beneficial for these horses, okay? Also, if I have a horse that's prone to tying up, we know that um, kind of the initial onset of tying up or Monday morning sickness happened in pasture horses, or I'm sorry, plow horses, that over the weekend were sitting idle but still being fed the same amount of starch in their diet. And so that excess starch, when they went back to work on Monday morning, cause them a variety of problems with their skeletal muscle function. And so these low starch feeds could also be really good for a horse that's prone to tying up, okay? But if we're looking for weight management, okay, if you've got a horse that maybe has a neck that looks like this, this really crusty neck 
is a big indicator of insulin resistance in horses. Um, the biggest thing to do is not just to say, well, I'm just gonna switch my concentrate to a low starch option, okay? Ideally, what we're gonna do there is actually cut back on the total um, concentrate overall, and we may even cut it out completely. And the major reason for that, again, is because we wanna feed that forage first. So most horses can be maintained on forage alone. And so those extra calories, no matter where they're coming from, whether it's in the forage or in the concentrate or both, are really not helping us achieve that weight loss. And so we, we save that low starch or the low calorie options and horse feeds as we need them. Um, but ideally, we're gonna probably cut back and really utilize just the calories and just the nutrients that are in that forage, okay? And again, not all horses should be on low starch diets, okay? So this kind of hit the market and became really popular and everybody was like, I need my horse on a low starch diet, all right? What we actually see for our performance horses is completely opposite. So horses that are exercising, specifically those that are really highly competitive, should actually have a diet that's higher in simple carbohydrates, okay, maybe compared to our horses at maintenance. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that starches and sugars actually form the foundation of muscle glycogen or what's in the muscle for that animal to use to be able to break down into energy that they can then um, use for work or performance or whatever else that it is that they're doing. Okay, so really important for them to have access to a good quality um, feed overall, but definitely a little bit higher in those simple carbohydrates because of how hard we ask them to work. Okay, the other thing is that horses don't have a gallbladder. So even though they can tolerate pretty high levels of fat in the diet, sometimes it can be hard for us to add additional fat to the point that we can actually get all of the calories in that that horse needs without utilizing simple carbs or sugars and starches. Okay, so for the horse that's really working hard, um, <clears throat> it's very challenging for us to feed a low starch option and get those calories in accordingly. So the no low carb kind of <clears throat> fad, if, if it's okay, that's not true, we can't have no carb diets for horses, and we need to be able to utilize the low starch options that are available to be able to feed the classes of horses that truly need them, but they're not the best choice for every single class, okay? Um, the other question I get a lot about why people are selecting um, these low starch options is that they think their horses are getting hot on traditional feeds, okay? And often this is because of starch. So if we think about a kid that maybe eats a Snickers bar, right, and 10 minutes later, they're running around like crazy, it's that sugar high. And the same thing can happen when we have a lot of starch within the feed. But a lot of times our owners will criticize their concentrate and forget about the starch and the sugars that are in the grasses. And so if I've got a period of time, say in the early spring, when I know my cool season grasses are growing really rapidly, they're gonna have a pretty high concentration of non-structural carbohydrates or starches and sugars, okay? That even if I put my horse on the most restricted concentrate diet, they may still get a little bit hot. Okay, if you've got a horse that's a harder keeper or one that doesn't keep weight on well, this is where instead of maybe going to just a low starch option, let's look for something that's maybe just a higher fat feed or a higher fat supplement that we can feed your horse to provide some extra calories without that extra excitement. The other piece to remember is that horses sometimes are just more excitable than others, right? Just like the, your human friends that you may have or even some horses that stand in your barn, some of them are just get more excited. Okay, so it, it may be really hard for us from a nutritional perspective to kind of change some of those behaviors that we know are just innate to that animal, okay? And again, the question comes back to, does the horse really need a concentrate? Or are we meeting that horse's nutritional needs every single day by just the forage that they're eating? Or maybe by a different supplement that would just fill in some missing pieces. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about kind of the magic pill or the magic supplement okay, that's, that's sitting around um, many different feed stores and many different barns, I'm sure, that are marketed to solve all or most of the problems that your horse may see, okay? So maybe it's Dr. Johnny's, you know, supplement to cure hot-headedness, insulin resistance, and improve hoof care, okay? And so um, the thing that I want you to remember in the back of your mind as we talk about different supplements, okay, is that most horses do not need them. And so if your horse is on a well-balanced diet, most of the time their nutritional needs are met, if not in excess, and those supplements are really just extra money that we're putting into those horses every day, okay? 
The other thing is that if people call me and say, okay, well, what do you recommend? What supplements can I feed? I do a lot of my recommendations based off of what research says and what that scientific data actually says is going to be effective in either fixing or treating or improving a, a condition or issue. Okay. Most of the supplements on the market are not tested or proven by any research. And so it's really hard for me to, to sometimes stand behind anything or stand behind a, a dosage amount if there's been no research on it. Okay. The other thing is that contents within your supplements, just like in the human nutrition world, are not regulated. So there's no way for you to really be able to go into the feed store and say with certainty that I pick up Dr. Johnny's magic supplement and it's not just sugar and salt. Okay. Now there are definitely some more reputable companies than not. And not that every single company is lying to you, but it's definitely something for you as a consumer to be aware of and, and use when you're making good um, decisions based on where to spend your money in supplements. Okay. The next thing is that if your horse really doesn't need additional supplements and it's not tested by research and we don't know exactly what's in it, the other factor is that they're usually fairly expensive and often they're the most expensive component of a diet if owners are choosing to feed them. So <clears throat> I leave you with the question, okay, as we move through this, of why does your horse actually need a supplement? And so we'll talk about a few situations where horses may need supplements, okay? But I would say in my experience, more often than not, supplements that are being fed to horses are probably not needed and also not effective. Okay, so when do we see supplementation as being effective? <clears throat> and so in this particular scenario, okay, horses with exertional rhabdomyolysis or tying up, okay, are in heavy or very heavy exercise or have certain diseases can sometimes benefit from vitamin E supplementation, okay? Now I'll tell you that most horses that are on a balanced diet are consuming adequate vitamin E to meet their needs, okay? We don't really see a huge time when vitamin E deficiency is really um, common in horses, again, that are feeding a good quality diet. All right, but what research has said, um, Carrie Williams back in 2004 did a lot of this work, is that for horses that were specifically um, going out and doing uh, upper level cross country and eventing, okay, those horses were on between 2,500 and 5,000 international units of vitamin E every day to reduce membrane leakage, okay? And really what that means is that uh, vitamin E functions as an antioxidant. So it helps to scavenge up what we call free radicals or free electrons from binding to different membranes, usually cell membranes, and causing damage that can make those cells not work as well. So vitamin E, again, if we have a horse that maybe has um, EPM, okay, I've seen a lot of veterinarians uh, encourage owners to feed supplemental vitamin E to help kind of modulate that disease propagation when we think about what EPM is doing to the nerves within that horse's body. But the question says then, okay, well, if I'm feeding a vitamin E supplement, right, how much it should be in there? And so really utilizing that number that's on the screen, okay, 2,500 to 5,000 international units should be what your supplement's providing to your horse every single day to be even close to effective, okay? Otherwise, we know that what they get normally from their diet is adequate for their needs on a regular basis. All right, the other question I get pretty frequently should I look for a supplement that has synthetic vitamin E or natural vitamin E? And so what research has shown is that there's really no difference in synthetic versus natural vitamin E's ability to scavenge those radicals or, or serve as an antioxidant within the body. So either source is fine. But what I would recommend is avoid the supplement if there's added selenium. And in our area here, we don't have um, soil that's really um, high in selenium. But there are some areas of the country, specifically um, over in Colorado and kind of the Midwest, where selenium in the soil is really high. And so there were cases where horses were eating a high selenium concentration in their forage. They were getting additional selenium in the concentrate, and they were getting more selenium in their supplements. And they actually developed the toxicity. So to avoid that, um, I would definitely recommend that you all look for a supplement that's more pure vitamin E or a vitamin E, vitamin C or vitamin E, vitamin A supplement, okay? And the reason why feeding with those additional vitamins could be beneficial for the horses that may benefit from a vitamin E supplementation is in this schematic down here, okay? 
So if we have vitamin E or something called alpha tocopherol is the appropriate name. So if you see that listed on a feed tag or something that says tocopherols added for as a preservative, they're talking about the vitamin E precursor. And so vitamin E is able to scavenge those free radicals or something that has an extra electron and it changes the formation of that um, and holds on to that specific radical within the molecule, okay? And then vitamin E, or I'm sorry, vitamin C is actually able to help convert vitamin E back to its original state so it can continue to scavenge those free radicals. So feeding them in conjunction with each other can actually be very beneficial. Okay, it's also important to remember that the horse actually is able to synthesize all of the vitamin C that it needs per day. And so for us actually synthesizing extra, I'm sorry, um, feeding extra over what your horse's body is able to synthesize in some cases is actually not helpful. Okay, so again, we want to feed these supplements when we have the chance to improve the, the status of your horse if they're experiencing these particular conditions. All right, one of the major supplements that I see overfed is electrolytes. And so really the only time that we see the benefit of having a horse on electrolyte supplementation is only if your horse is heavily sweating, okay? Now there are obviously some caveats here if your horse has been diagnosed with anhydrosis and some other conditions, but in the general scheme of things, only if the horse is heavily sweating do we need to supplement with electrolytes, okay? And this is not just the fact that your horse goes outside in the summer in Tennessee and gets a little sweaty. Okay, this is the horse that maybe every time they're working is looking like this horse up here with that white foamy sweat, or maybe our race horses that are going out and working really hard and they come back in and they're just dripping in sweat. And the reason that we care about this is that horse sweat is actually hypertonic or contains more of these electrolytes and other molecules than the horse's blood does. So they're losing a lot, specifically sodium, chloride, and potassium. Okay, those are the three that we see primarily within the sweat. There's also a little bit of magnesium and calcium. But what we know from research is that daily supplementation of electrolytes can actually throw off your horse's natural balance. So again, if your horse is not heavily sweating, we don't need to feed an electrolyte supplement every day. The other thing to keep in mind is that not all of your supplements on the electrolyte side are equal. And so when you look at the ingredient list, if you're thinking that your horse may need an electrolyte supplement, Sodium chloride, okay, or NaCl, should be the first ingredient. It should not be sugar, it should not be glucose, it should not be fructose, okay? Because glucose and fructose are not doing anything to help replenish your horse's electrolytes. And so although they may be added for flavoring, they should be lowered in the list of ingredients and sodium chloride should be first. And that'll give you an indicator of the quality of this supplement, okay? <clears throat> All right, so what about joint supplements? So like I said, these are usually the ones that people are getting the most excited about. Um, the, the thing that I want you to kind of keep in mind here is that not all horses are going to respond. And even in some cases where we see uh, more beneficial uh, intervention for joints, not all horses will respond equally to that, okay? The other is that a lot of joint supplements that we feed um, the proteins and the different structures, there's not a lot of evidence that says that these supplements are making it past the stomach into the bloodstream and to your horse's joints at a sufficient amount to cause any therapeutic increase, okay? So this is probably the biggest area that research has been done in is the joint supplementation realm, and there's not a lot of data that says that any of them are really worth too much. And so, if you are really dead set on feeding some sort of joint supplement, okay, look for the ingredients that we've got on the list. So glucosamine, glucosamine chondroitin or chondroitin sulfate, um, MSM, or hyaluronic acid, okay? Those are the ones that we're really gonna look for for more of our quality, but again, there's not a lot of evidence that says once you feed it to your horse and they digest it and it makes it into the bloodstream that it's really doing very much. The other is that a lot of the supplements that you're buying over the counter are much lower in concentration than, than what we have seen that could be fairly effective in horses. And so you're really getting what you pay for here and across the board. So if the supplement is cheaper, it's probably going to be less effective. Okay, so really use a lot of caution and buyer beware on our joint supplements. Okay, so usually when people ask me, well, what joint supplement should I feed? I usually encourage you to talk to your veterinarian. 
And so there's a lot of medications that you can utilize through your veterinarian, um, whether they're injectable joint solutions into the muscle or into the bloodstream, or actually just joint injections that have been proven to be much more effective than our oral supplements and often come at the same cost. And so really talk to your veterinarian if you're worried about your horse's joint conditions and kind of talk about some of the costs of these other interventions as opposed to just the daily supplement for joint health. Okay, so what about hoof supplements, right? So a lot of times people will send me a picture of a hoof that looks very similar to the one on the right and say, what can I feed to fix this, okay? And so research shows us that biotin, iodine, and zinc, okay, in the concentrations that are listed up there have been shown to be effective. And so if you're looking for a hoof supplement, I want to see that there's at least 20 milligrams per day of biotin. Um, there's at least one milligram per day of iodine and there's at least 175 to 250 milligrams per day of zinc, all right? If they're lower than that, I'm usually fairly skeptical of the fact that they're going to do very much. Um, and there's been some research listed that methionine, or what we think is the horse's second limiting amino acid, may also play a role in hoof health, okay? But what I'll tell you is that a lot of people will tend to blame their hoof quality problems on a low or a poor quality protein diet. When in reality, if your horse has a true protein deficiency, we're gonna to start to see some other markers of, of protein deficiency before we really start to see a lot of issues with hoof health, okay? Now, part of that has to do with the fact that the horse's hoof grows really slowly. Um, and remember, it's growing from this kind of top uh, coronet band or periopal area downward. So when I'm looking for something that's really changing my horse's hoof quality, I'm usually not gonna look down here I'm going to start looking right up here at that coronet band and watch it come down. Okay. The other thing is that we need to consider the environment. And so if my horse is working every day on really hard ground or they're standing in the field that's not very um, soft for them, <clears throat> my horse's feet will always have some challenging issues, even if I provide them the best plane of nutrition. Okay. There's also no supplement that I can give that takes the place of good farrier work. Okay, so really look at, you know, talk to your farrier about what your horse's feet look like. Get them on a regular trimming program and then start to look at some of the supplementation, okay? And a lot of times people are looking for that quick fix, right? I want to feed something and in a month I want my horse's feet to be perfect, okay? It'll often take between six to eight months for this hoof to grow out, if not longer. So if I start feeding a supplement today, I'm not going to start to see my horse's hoof really improve for almost a year. And so that can be really frustrating, especially for some of these supplements that are a little more expensive and you watching kind of all of that go into your horse's mouth without much visibility on the, the effect side for about a year. Okay, the other magic supplement, okay, that we see is <coughs> weight builders. And so these are marketed at your horses that are harder keepers, okay? What we see is that weight gain should really be the result of increasing the carbohydrate content and the fat content of your horse's diet. And so we can accomplish this a lot of times through just increasing the amount of forage that your horse gets or adding maybe a little bit more concentrate or top dressing oil to your horse's diet. A lot of these weight builders have a higher oil content, but there's really nothing more fat dense than oil. Okay, so there's more calories that I can get in and often at a cheaper cost than a, than a weight builder. And so I would really encourage you to talk to your agent or talk to a nutritionist um, about purchasing a weight builder as opposed to doing some other nutritional things that may um, save you a bit of money, okay? Again, protein deficiencies are fairly hard to induce in horses. And so a lot of times we don't see horses utilizing weight builder um, for a protein deficiency. Okay, and also, if we're worried about you um, improving your horse's top line, okay, a lot of that is not due to a protein deficiency, it's due to the way your horse walks. So again, you know, don't just jump to the weight builder because somebody said, well, it put top line on my horse. Okay, that's probably not exactly true. The better thing to utilize, okay, and, and most often if we worry or are worried about different deficiencies in the diet, is actually to use a ration balancer. Okay, so this is meant to be fed in much smaller quantities usually and fill in the different pieces that we know to be an issue in equine nutrition. Um, so that's where I would definitely recommend kind of looking for that ration balancing aid over a weight builder um, and maybe going to oil over a weight builder itself. 
Okay, so I wanted to mention holistic remedies because I get questions on this fairly frequently too, okay? And if you take nothing else home from this slide, just remember that natural does not mean that it's safe for your horses, okay? So some of these natural ingredients um, can also be parts of toxic plants. And so horsetail is, oh, I'm sorry, um, is actually what's shown over here on the right. And horsetail has been known to cause weight loss, diarrhea, um, nervous conditions, lack of coordination, stumbling, falling down. Um, and a lot of times it's actually included in horse supplements, okay, as a, a marketed at a weight loss function, okay? But we know that it has other problems, so don't feed it, all right? There are also some products, specifically Echinacea and some others, that can act as a blood thinner. So if your horse is already on other medications and we're feeding some herbal products, they can not only interact, but maybe cause more of a problem, okay? Another thing is that if you're actively competing, okay, some of the supplements um, may contain substances that are on the banned list for competition, okay, specifically valerian, which is down here on the right. And so it would be really unfortunate if you have to submit your horse's urine or a blood sample for a drug test, they're on an herbal supplement and that happens to be on the banned substance list. Okay, the, the piece that hopefully you're starting to see synonymously throughout here is that a lot of research has not been done on herbal products in horses, okay? There's been a lot of research in humans, but horses and humans don't always react the same, okay? Specifically for garlic, right? Garlic kind of got this reputation of being able to keep flies away from your horses and it kind of hit the market as kind of this wonder supplement that could do a lot of things. But garlic fed in high quantities causes something called Heinz body anemia. All right, where basically the, the red blood cells start to change their structure and they can't carry oxygen as well. And so we don't want that to happen in your horses. Better to use a fly spray product or some other options than overloading your horse with garlic. All right, so what about the omega-6, omega-3 ratio, cardiac health um, fad that we see in the, the human world, okay? And it's really well documented. So we know that there are benefits of keeping that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio lower in humans, all right? But again, it's not well studied in horses. And so we don't really know what ratio was really the best for horses or how much they actually need, okay? But what we do know is that horses require both linoleic or omega-6 fatty acids and alpha-linolenic or an omega-3 fatty acid in the diet. And their structure is over here to kind of help you understand what omega-3 and omega-6 actually means, okay? So if we start numbering, okay, from over here, just to, to give you an indication, we have one carbon here, one carbon here, and one carbon here. So the first double bond we see on the third carbon, okay, or omega-3, change of the third, okay? So down here, if we look from the omega end, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so this is an omega-6 fatty acid. And so really we're just talking about the placement of the double bonds, okay, and what happens to them within the body. And so some oils have gotten a, a reputation of being better than others for a couple different reasons, okay? So corn oils and a couple different vegetable oils are higher in omega-6s. So this is where they kind of on the human side got a lot of a bad reputation, okay, for contributing to inflammation, and a variety of other conditions. Um, <clears throat> but again, this is based on human knowledge. So we don't really have any evidence that the same thing happens in horses. On the opposite side, flaxseed or linseed oil um, tends to be more typically fed to horses than <clears throat> maybe fish oils are, okay? But they have a very similar omega-3 content, okay? And a very similar omega-6 to omega-3 ratio as a lot of fish diets. And so, the question becomes, what could you feed to your horse if you're really worried about this omega-6, omega-3 ratio, okay? So what I want you to take home is that pasture grasses, okay, and what your horse should be eating as the primary component of their diet has a very similar ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s as flaxseed or even as our fish diet for people, okay? The, the number of omega-3s and two to three cups of flaxseed or what we would expect horses to eat um, per day if we were supplementing them is the same as almost 22 pounds of good quality hay. And so if you think back to the beginning where we talked about um, how much hay your horse should eat per day, right? If I have my thousand pound horse that's eating two to two and a half percent of their body weight, 
they should be eating 20 to 25 pounds ish of quality hay per day. So we're already meeting our horses omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in a good ratio as we would be if we supplemented with flaxseed, okay? And so that forage diet gives you a ratio of about 0.3 to 0.6 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. And if we start adding a, a fat added concentrate in here to the horse diet, we're at about 8 to 1. Okay, human guidelines tell us that we should eat an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio diet of about 10 to 1. Okay, but Western diets typically are much higher than that, um, even though we're not <clears throat> seeing a lot of benefit maybe to the, the traditional diet that we eat we still have this guideline for humans. But we don't have a recommendation for our horses yet. So again, if your horse is eating good quality hay, they're eating it at the right amounts, um, they're probably okay, all right? And the research is really conflicting. So we don't see that there's a reduction of inflammation if we change and feed horses only flaxseed or linseed oil, okay? We haven't really seen a lot of evidence that if we feed one particular oil to horses that it will improve insulin resistance. So <clears throat> from a recommendation perspective, if I have a horse that's on a really poor or a really low quality forage, this is when I probably am gonna recommend a really high quality fat supplement, okay? And again, I'm looking to improve that fat profile. So this is where I may recommend maybe linseed or flaxseed oil. And for horses that will eat it, menhaden fish oil or krill oil can also be used. They're often very expensive and require some flavoring. All right, but if I have a horse on good quality forage, their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is already pretty low. And so for that particular owner, the money that you would spend on a very expensive oil is probably not worth it for just fixing the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, okay? So we can use rice bran as shown in the picture, maybe soybean oil. We can still use corn oil or canola oil. And so in a taste study that was done, horses actually prefer corn oil over all of the other oils. Okay, we probably need to redo that study. It was done a little while ago. But really, corn oil is what we have. It's readily available. It's fairly cheap for the owners. Um, and we don't see any issues with it um, with regard to a research perspective currently in our horses. All right, and our last diet fad, okay, is feeding a homemade or a raw diet, so to speak. Um, this kind of hit with our paleo group and a few others when those diets hit the human side. All right, and really all it is is basically people taking homemade mixes um, and preferring them in a non-processed format over our commercially available or any sort of processed feeds. Okay, now there are a few times where this could be beneficial. If we know that your horse is having some allergy issues, and trying to figure out what allergy or what particular piece of that feed your horse is allergic to, we can really add in one ingredient at a time to see what the problem is, okay? This also could be economical if you're feeding in large, large quantities. So if you're able to get, you know, a whole lot of corn, a whole lot of oats, and some other pieces and mix them together, that may work, all right? But the big drawback here, and I caution a lot of owners if they're really into to doing this, is that these diets are not balanced, okay? So if you just go and kind of cattywampus throw some corn and some oats and some barley in and feed it to your horse, it's not a balanced diet, okay? And we lose a lot of that digestibility or the nutrient availability to your horse without some sort of processing, okay? So if I just feed my horse straight corn, okay, some, some dried shelled corn, <clears throat> If I look at the digestibility or what my horse gets out of it, it will be substantially less than if I fed him some steam flaked corn, okay? And it has to do with how the nutrients are changing their um, conformation within the corn um, and what that horse is able to access from an enzymatic digestion and also a fermentative digestion, okay? So uh, if you're really into looking for maybe a homemade or a raw diet, okay, please, please, please contact a nutritionist, okay, or seek some sort of consultation to balance that ration for you, all right? Even if you save a lot of money, if you create some sort of nutrient deficiency, it's probably going to cost you more in the long run to fix that, that deficiency and any other problems that your horse may have. So if you really would like to do a homemade, raw, unprocessed diet, talk to a nutritionist, and, and they'll be able to help you kind of create that diet. Okay. So the take-home points that I hope you all have gotten from this, okay, not all horses need a low-starch diet, okay? So not there's no no-carb diet that exists for horses, and we can utilize these low-starch options for horses 
um, if it is the right kind of choice for their particular phenotype or whatever management style that we're looking for, all right? There's no magic supplement or magic pill that will cure, correct, or fix all the problems that your horse has, all right? So beware if there's a label that's claiming that. And usually our supplements are not necessary if we have a balanced diet. There's very few exceptions to that rule. We know that forage has a high supply of omega-3 fatty acids, and so the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s is already pretty good for our horses that are consuming a good quality hay or good quality pasture. All right, so there's usually not a, a big need for us to worry about that ratio specifically um, just on its own, okay? Use a holistic remedy with caution. There's, remember, there's little evidence on herbal remedies being effective for horses. And the homemade unprocessed diets are possible, but definitely seek some advice for balancing. And so I hope that was helpful for you and, again, gave you some kind of tips of how to, to search for different products within the feed store um, and also maybe look at what you're feeding at home. Um, I added my contact information here, and obviously um, please feel free to contact Matt if you have any questions or your local county agent. Um, do you all have any questions? Thank you, Dr. Ivy. We'll leave, we'll leave, leave a little time for questions here, but I want to thank you especially because this is really great information, um, especially a hot topic as it is uh, at this time and day. Um, but one of the things that we, we've talked about over the entire series of webinars, including Dr. Ivy's, is knowing what's in your forage, knowing what's in your hay. It all keeps reflecting back. As, you know, if you're wanting to talk to Dr. Ivy about a nutrition plan for your horse, it all comes back to you. You've got to have information for what the majority of your horse diet is. And the only way to do it, you can't look at it, the only way to do it is actually get an analysis to really begin to break down that nutrition program. So thank you for that. I will stop recording now say that we will have our next meeting on October 25th. Um, at the conclusion of this weekend, we talked about any questions. Thank you. Have a good day.